Good evening, everybody. We are Group 7, and we are presenting on how that person is so smart, but he looks like he lacks executive presence. And my name's Benet. I'm Tim. My name's Ian. And we're about to start. All right. Since this is Advanced Business Communications, we decided to take uh, one part of this reading, which was rather long. It was a series of unfortunate faux pas in the workplace. We decided to focus on one of the most important parts, which is how to look composed. Because composure is judged by nonverbal communication, and that's one of the most uh, impactful and yet often overlooked aspects of communication. Uh, we've broken it down to most, the five most important parts. Uh, touch, you know, how you touch or don't touch other people. Facial expressions, body movement, your overall physical appearance, and your space decorations. First we'll get touch. We're going to start with the very basic meeting of someone, the handshake. Handshakes should uh, convey confidence. And if you ever get the uh, you ever get the overly aggressive handshake guy, where he's like wanting to crush your hands <laughs> to assert some sort of dominance, that's terrible. I mean, it, that, that that's overbearing. It doesn't come off as authentic. But then you get the weak handshake guy, <laughs> and that just sort of uh, doesn't very really show much confidence, and it's a very very poor first impression. <clears throat> uh, so what you want to go for is just the middle of the road, right road. A good firm handshake, eye contact. Don't hold on too long. You don't want to do the, uh, the shake. This, this gets a little weird sometimes, the crawling up the arm with the second hand. Not always the best for a professional environment. Um, next up is time management. Time management is very important because if you can either appear that it controls you or you control it. <clears throat> this goes more than just obviously being late and rushing around between meetings. That can obviously show a lack of control, lack of prior planning, and that looks very unprofessional. Um, being late can also be seen as being rude. Uh, if you're running around seeming frantic, doesn't look good, it's unprofessional. And that also goes with your speech. If you're up here talking real fast and you're very nervous, it's going real fast, uh, if you're like, wait, wait, slow down, it comes off as immature and unprepared. Uh, however, people has been shown that people who speak slower at a more controlled pace which is very hard for me after a 16-hour day and monster energy drinks. Uh, <clears throat> it's hard for me to come across like that. Um, but once you practice presentating, presentating, presenting, it becomes easier. Um, and another thing with time management is also how you can create sort of a, an aura about yourself. For example, if you're expecting a phone call at 3 o'clock and you're sitting there with your phone and it rings, weird, hello, that sort of seems you're, you're, you're sort of, you seem very, very desperate. You know, you want to sit there, and I actually used that today. I had a phone interview this morning at 11 o'clock, and I was sitting in my car at 10.59, and it rang, I'm like, no, you're going to ring three times. <laughs> then I'm going to hang you up. I was like, hello? And it was, a, it, it, and it went very well. Next one is your facial expression. <clears throat> they say that, if you ever say someone's like, oh, she seemed nervous, or oh, he seemed really excited, most of the time, they're reading that person's facial expressions because you can look at someone's posture or how they're holding themselves, but your mouth, your eyes, and your eyebrows. And the one thing I found pretty particularly interesting in this reading was the emphasis put on eyebrows. For some reason, this is this guy that went most of the section, he was talking about how much someone's eyebrows, the level they come up in any part, I can't really see it in my, my glasses, um, how much that actually will convey a message, how it conveys the important parts of your sentence if you raise your eyebrows. Um, and obviously, if you're like Jim Carrey, you can be extremely expressive with every part of your uh, face, your mouth, and your eyes. And so at that, I will be handing this off to you. Thank you. So what Tim was saying, those are kind of the really big ones, right? Your handshake, your facial expressions, you know, those are, those are the, first express, the first impressions you make on people. What I'm going to get into next are kind of more of the more subtle. Uh, everybody knows, for the most part, about what Tim was speaking about. This is the stuff that kind of can set you apart from the people who know how to give a handshake, who know how to control their facial expressions, right? So the first thing I'm going to talk about is body movement. And when you're when you're speaking, it's important to try to remain still. And, you know, not you know, not completely still like a robot. That's that's weird, and it, it freaks people out, right? But it's also important to not you know to start moving around the room, you know, <laughs> scratching your neck, looking weird, because right? Because nobody in this room knows if I really know what I'm talking about here, or if I've prepared, 
But it's my job through what I'm saying and through my nonverbals to convince you that I do know what I'm talking about. And so to do that, I can convince you by being calm, being composed, looking like I know what I'm doing, right? So an excellent example is with The Godfather. You know, like any Italian movie, your, your mob boss, your, you know, um, the, the actual reading used the Marlon Brando. And the reason that they use that example is because he is, he's calm, he's so in control of the situations. It intim he's so in control that it intimidates people to a point, right? Um, you know, in the text he was using the example of, he sits there completely calm, stroking his cat, and that's the only movement, right? So he's in complete control. You, you know he knows, you can throw any surprise at him, he's gonna handle it, right? They also use an excellent example of, if you watch your local weatherman, you know, they move around the screen a little bit, but for the most part, they do all their gesturing with their hands. They don't, they don't move around, they say, this is what I'm showing you, if they stay, they stay still, they're in control, and uh, that's, how, that's, how you can, that's how you can demonstrate to people that you're in control of the situation. Uh, moving on, another another important aspect is your physical appearance. And I know this this is a little bit of a generalization, but a lot of people my age and my in my generation we like we like to stand apart a little bit. We get into the workplace, we want to make, we want to express ourselves. It's not always the best thing, right? It's a, uh, as you can see here, it's important to fit in, right? If you get into a you get into to a conservative workplace, a lot of corporate America is still very conservative. So if you get in and you, you don't look like everybody else, you immediately set yourself apart. And that can be a good thing, that can be a bad thing. But are you, are you really wanting to risk that on the off chance that it is a bad thing? Well, now you've just eliminated yourself, right? So, in certain instances, it just comes down to personal preference. Uh, organizations, kind of, there's, there's typically not a express written <coughs> This is how we dress, this is what we do, this is how the environment is. You're kind of just expected to come in and get it, right? So it's important when you, know, when you come into organizations to, to observe the, cult, the, uh, the culture, right? And to, to make sure that you fit in. And of course, there's, you know, there's the do's and the don'ts. You know, look nice, tuck your stuff in, match your shoes, match your belts, you know. Don't, don't wear anything too provocative or so, you know, keep, be smart. It basically comes down to being using your common sense. Uh, so moving forward, this may not apply to some of us right now having our own offices, but if you, you know if you have a you have a cubicle. Um, it's how you decorate, how you decorate your space is extremely important. Um, I know personally, if I walk into somebody's office and there's papers all over the desk, or you know, there's stuff from three years ago that are in boxes that haven't been sent off to storage. You know, what, is this person really in control of their, really in control of their workplace? Do they, you know, if I leave something with them, can I, can I hope that they're going to get it done? When you walk into someone's office, who, it's it's clearly organized. They have a space for everything. You, you have a sense that that person's in control, and they know what they're doing. Um, the the text also got into a little bit of feng shui, feng shui. I told you I was going to mispronounce that, <laughs> but. You know, what I would say there is, I, you know, unless you're just an absolute expert in it, be normal. But, <laughs> you know, if you, if you know the stuff and you're, and you're good at it, it's a talking piece. If someone walks into your office and they, you know, they, they're, they're experts in it as well, well, you just made an excellent first impression on that person. Um, you can also, with the use of your college degrees, um, you know, pictures with important people, um, also give off that sense of, of executive presence. Uh, so I'm gonna, from here, I'm gonna let Vinay take over and he is going to finish this up. So I want everyone to look at this slide right here, okay? No one is actually gonna pay attention to what's going on here because it is filled with nothing but filler. But this is what you see sometimes in a lot of information, a lot of text. Don't write this down, please don't. This is not actually <laughs> This is nothing but filler text, and even though it might have great information that I spent hours working on, no one's going to read it and no one's going to process it. The only reason people are taking it down right now is because we might have a quiz on it. But if you're presenting to your boss, they're not going to digest all this information. What you really need to keep in mind are the following points. Let's assume you've already gotten your executive presence. Now what you need to start doing is looking at your good presentation tips. So the first thing that we need to think about is how to emphasize all our points in a business setting. 
When we have all these points up here, notice how we have this. Now, let's say that you're in a business setting and you say, we can reduce the co your cost substantially while still meeting all your quality needs. Notice how you're reading this, but you turn around to the person when you need to make the emphasized point for the next one. We can increase your speed of completion and still meet all your deadlines. In addition to that, we can provide specialists that fill all your positions. See how the difference is that there's an emphasis in what's not actually there, and that's how you can really bring life to your presentation. In addition, 10 words or less, and you know, as an example, um, everything in this uh, presentation, we've actually proofread, it's less than 10, 10 words, so you're able to more easily digest it, as well as just eye contact in general. It's good to make eye contact with your audience, and it makes, it makes them feel like you're connected with them. So that's definitely what you want to focus on. So more tips. This is what was stated in the book. An example of this is if I'm here talking, but the presentation's over there, your attention, uh, your attention is diverted in two different directions, and we can't have that. The other thing that the book mentioned was a bad example of doing what exactly I'm doing right now. If I just keep pacing and walking around, someone in the audience is actually just going to become nauseated, and you can't focus. It's like what we mentioned before. Stand still, present yourself using your, you know, your gestures, your movements, draw attention to that, but not to you, you yourself. They want you to focus on the content not you. That being said, you also have to think about how much information is on a slide. Um, and we'll illustrate this in the very next slide, and just positioning in general we just covered. This is an example of what we just went over, but now the three most important points are now highlighted in yellow. These three highlighted are the main points. What this does is that even though there's a lot of information, say this was all really relevant information, you're showing that you have a lot of content, but you don't need to go through all of it. Instead, what you can do for a good presentation is you can go over and say, these are the three main points, they're highlighted, and there's value in showing quantity, but not necessarily telling about all of it. Okay, So you really want to highlight those points while still showing that you really have the knowledge. And in addition to that, we're looking at Steve Jobs once again for an example of what is passion. If I stood up here and said nothing but everything in a really monotone voice, all of you would fall asleep within the next five minutes and no one would really understand what I'm saying. Whereas if you're more animated and you really understand what you're saying and what you're talking about, people are naturally drawn into what you're saying and it really adds to um, the presentation itself. You can really make the content come alive. And the other, op the other thing that the book mentioned that I thought was really interesting was the idea between speaking quietly and speaking uh, too loud. However, you can really raise the volume of your voice and you can really push the envelope in seeing how, how, how high can you go before you know, an audience member tells you, hey, uh, can you bring it down a bit? That's a bit too loud. So the, the idea here is be loud first as opposed to being soft. You can't be too loud. I mean, it's really hard to be too loud. Like, I'm pretty loud and I can't even go longer than this. So that's all that we need to know to be convincing. And we're hoping that we convinced you that this is how you should present your presentation to the future. Thank you.